I'm more of a storyteller than I am a anything else. So you're going to hear a few stories now about growing things, and that's what where this this is all about. Whether it's pomegranates or some other fruit. But today we're going to since it is that uh, you're the pomegranate, we're going to concentrate on pomegranates, which is something I've spent a lot of time with. I think we have a PowerPoint presentation. I think that uh, if you'll go ahead and click up the first picture, uh, where is the? Uh, you're still working on it. Yeah. Well, while, while they're working on it, uh, they're still working on getting it ready. Uh, while they are, I'll tell you a few little things how I got started in this. Uh, back a number of years ago, uh, I was looking at growing different types of fruit that could stand dry climate and low rainfall. Uh, low rainfall and a lot of heat as well. <clears throat> Where I live is in Brownwood, Texas, which is in central Texas, nearly in the middle of the state. Uh, we're right on the edge of what you would call West Texas. We're in what we call West, West Central Texas. We get about 28 inches of rain a year, and, uh, and we're in what you would call uh, Zone uh, 8A or 7B, right on the line of those two uh, USDA cold hardening zones, which is uh, a little bit far north for, a, for a, some of these processed uh, rainy varieties, but it uh, is, uh, is fine for, for a number of varieties. Anyway, I selected, the free fruit I selected to grow were apricots, uh, pomegranates, and jujubes. And uh, so when I was doing research on uh, pomegranates, I uh, was looking for varieties that, that I thought would do well commercially, because I was looking at this from a commercial standpoint. Uh, and uh, I read an article by Barbara Beer. Uh, Barbara, are you here today? Oh, you are, good. There's Barbara Beer right back there. She kind of, everybody give her a hand, because she got the place for this And she helped me uh, learn about Dr. Levin in Turkmenistan. She, I'm sure some of you may have read articles she's written about uh, going to Turkmenistan. Uh, and uh, trying to reach the research station. Uh, although she wasn't successful when she was there, she did talk to a lot of people. And uh, as since has been came fairly well acquainted with Dr. Levin, although it's a little hard to talk to him because he speaks Russian. <laughs> and the translation is sometimes a little bit difficult. But, but we, we make the best of it. She published a book called Pomegranate Roads by Dr. Levin, which has been distributed fairly widely in the United States. Very interesting book. If you don't have a copy of it, I would suggest you try to get one. It's, it's, it's as much a story as it is a uh, uh, culture of pomegranates. Uh, anyway, basically we found out that some of the Turkmenistan or the old Soviet Union Republic of Turkmenistan uh, or were cold hardy enough for where I was. That's what I was looking for. And uh, some of the varieties had been brought into the United States and sent to uh, Byron, Georgia, to the USDA uh, back in the early 80s. And those plants did fairly well there. They weren't well taken care of but uh, because it wasn't a major research project for them. But they, uh, they did uh, get some information and evaluation of the, the first pomegranates that came into this country from Central Asia. Of course, we had the, already had the varieties uh, in California that have been here for since the uh, 1800s. Uh, but these Central Asian pomegranates are, there's a lot of them that are quite different from, from what wonderful is the common variety you find in California. Wonderful is a great variety, there's nothing wrong with it. But there is some, there's a lot of variety out there in the pomegranate world, just like uh, all fruit, there's a lot of variety between uh, between different uh, uh, cult uh, cultivars. So anyway, I, I uh, tried was trying to get a hold of plants, and the first plants I got came from Byron, Georgia, by way of uh, 
uh, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Chris Englison and another man called uh, in North Carolina by the name of Jack Rice. And those were the, from the first uh, shipment of uh, plants of this country. Later on, there was another shipment that came in from Turkmenistan right before uh, the uh, Turkmen government lost interest in the project and decided to just about destroy it. There were 1,100 varieties in Turkmenistan of pomeranates. And today, the thing is just about gone. But luckily, it's the best varieties have been were brought out of the country and are now, most of them are located at the germplasm collection in Davis. And I believe Jeff is here. He is the, he's the coordinator for the Pomeranians. Jeff, are you here? Jeff Mosfelder. If he's not, you'll see him later at the tasting. But he is the curator for the Pomeranians at the germplasm collection, and he is here today with some of the Pomeranians. Some of the products, and you can taste them. So as a result, uh, we got cuttings you know, quite a few years ago from, that, from the germplasm collection, as well as the early cuttings I got from Georgia and we started evaluating for commercial possibilities. And we've learned a lot. We learn a little every year. Uh, we had some, there's some mistakes along the way, some commercial mistakes that caused a lot of problems with misconceptions about some of the varieties. But generally, we've, we've got a fairly good evaluation now, and it's taken us a long time to do it, of what varieties are commercial or varieties, in other words, when I say commercial, I mean, you know, better varieties for anybody to grow, whether it's commercial or in the backyard. It doesn't make any difference. They're good varieties for anything. Uh, the variety that had a misconception about it was one called Parthianca that came out of Central Asia. It's a very good variety, but it got, uh, let's say, mislabeled when, it, when the, a large nursery in the game named it Garnish Sage, renamed it Garnish Sage. And uh, it was originally thought to be Parkeonk, and it turned out to be Elf. And so some of the people that got the early Parkeonk sash plants didn't get what they thought they were getting. But basically, Parkeonk is a good variety. Have we got the PowerPoint ready now, or are you still working on it? Still working it, but there's hope. Oh, they're getting, they're getting close. All right. Um, Give me a second here. Uh, anyway, we started growing the pomegranates and started selecting varieties. And uh, you know, it's real hard. You grow a plant, you get it grown up, and you start it starts fruiting, and, and then you find that's not real good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awful difficult. But we have to wind up because we were doing it commercially. We had every time we found one that wasn't good, we had to pull it out of the ground. And then every time I do that, it's like pulling teeth, you know, I don't like to do it. But we did. We, we eventually started it down to 35 different varieties. We started with a whole lot more than that. But, but it is hard when you have a plant and you, you spend three or four years growing it up and then find out you have to take it out of the ground. But you do. You just have to do it. Because there are other, you know, a lot of times there would be a much better variety that could be growing right in that same place. So anyway, we eliminated a lot of it. And uh, uh, there's one of the members of this organization, David Silverstein, did a lot of work with Pomerantz for a number of years. Uh, David, are you here? I don't know whether he's here today or not. But anyway, I was in contact with him, and we exchanged there. He, of course, as some of you know, he lives in San Diego. And uh, we exchanged cuttings with him as well. We decided to import some plants from Australia, David and I did. And David brought them into San Diego uh, under a two-year quarantine because, as you know, anything that comes into this country has to be run through a quarantine before it can be distributed. And uh, so uh, the Australian pomegranates were actually Indian pomegranates. They went from India to Australia to the United States. And now the uh, germplasm collection has most of the varieties that, that we imported from, uh, from Australia, Indian varieties we imported from Australia, in the collection. You'll see them in the collection now. Uh, varieties such as, I don't know whether they're available for just distribution yet, but some of them are still young plants. Uh, varieties such as Ganesh, 
and Merdula. Now we have Merdula growing in Texas and it's it turned out to be a fairly good variety. It's an it's a Indian variety that was a cross uh, between a Russian variety and Ganesh and Merdula was the result of that cross. Uh, they were trying to get more red color in the skin of the pomeranate so they crossed the Russian red variety. Uh, there we go. So they, yeah. Yeah. yeah I get with that. So they crossed the two varieties and came up with Merdula in, in, uh, in India. And uh, we now have it in the United States. And this turned out to be a very, it's very frost sensitive. So if any of you live anywhere out of zone 8, 8B or lower, it, it is not, it's, it'll work in 8B, but it won't work in any lower zone, cold hearted zone. It's just too frost sensitive. But a lot of you live in zones 9 and 8B. And, and even 10, so it worked for a lot. And it's a very good variety. It's a commercial variety in India. And when we say commercial, we mean that it's, run, it's been tested but for productivity, uh, for color, for uh, taste, uh, and for uh, uh, bigger growth. It has to meet all those criteria to become a commercial variety. There are a lot of varieties that are good for home growers that wouldn't make a commercial. Uh, Merdula is one that stood the test, and uh, I believe we've done skipped on to the first picture here. Okay. Uh, we're, well, we're back to the first one, anyway. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, I have a little bit of a back problem, so if you don't mind, I hope you don't mind, I'll sit down here. And, Anyway, this first picture, we're going to go through a few pictures, and I'll continue telling you stories later. This first picture is a four-year-old pomegranate orchard. It has been pruned just previously, and these trees are being grown on the tree system instead of the shrub. There's a uh, uh, non-consensus in the world about whether a pomegranate should be a tree or a bush. Most of the world, and in nature, it is a bush. So we could call it a tree bush, but it's a bush. And, and it grows that way wild. In uh, the wild area, the point of origin of the pomegranate is the area between Iran and Turkmenistan and in the mountains of, uh, of uh, eastern Iraq. That is the point of origin of the pomegranates. They grow wild there and they grow as a bush. California uh, commercial growers decided that they would produce better as a tree. So they prune them to a tree. They don't normally grow as a tree. But you can prune them as a tree and you'll have pretty good production that way. The production will be good as a tree. Most of the world grows them, grow them as a three to four trunk bush or a three to four bump tree, however you want to say it. You have to cut the shoots that grow up from the ground off these trees, or they'll go to nothing but growth. To, uh, but growth. They put all their energy in producing suckers, especially during the first seven years of production. Uh, you see some pomegranates growing around that's got 50 or 100 stems growing up, and hardly any fruit on them. That's just because they haven't been pruned back. I better caution you one thing. Some trees that don't have any fruit on them are ornamentals and won't have any fruit. But, but so, so if you see one that doesn't have any fruit, doesn't mean it's just because it's got suckers. There are some that don't bear fruit that are ornamentals. Uh, produce beautiful flowers, but don't produce any fruit. Anyway, this orchard has just been pruned. You see they haven't collected the pruning of the cuttings yet, but they've pruned off all the suckers. And that's basically all that's been pruned off this orchard. It's just the suckers that come up from the ground. Also, this orchard's on a micro sprinkler system, and there's a micro sprinkler at each tree. These are adjustable micro sprinklers that, so you can increase the radius of the irrigation circle as the trees get larger. It's a very, very wonderful irrigation system. Next slide, if you would. Yeah. This is just an example, and these are ready to eat arrows. I don't know whether you've seen these in grocery stores, but you'll be seeing them more and more. I'm sure you, probably a lot of you have. You'll be seeing them more and more in stores. And uh, in the future, I think you'll, you'll see all over the United States. Right now, the biggest part of these are being sold in California. There is a, a plant at Reedley, California that produces these arrows. 
And uh, they are pretty, aren't they? This is not a very well-focused picture, but <laughs> still, you can tell them. The bright red ruby fruit looks really good. Next picture. This is a processing plant. This is what uh, looked like coming off the conveyor belt when they first come into the plant. Uh, these plant, these fruit are first washed. This will give you some idea, and it will help you a little bit on how you would do it at home. They're first washed, and then they're sorted, and uh, all the small fruit go to go to juice. Only the large fruit are sold for fresh fruit. Uh, some of the medium-sized fruit generally are used for arrows. They use whatever the, whatever is available, but they normally do not use the small fruit. Nearly all the small fruit are the blemish fruit are used for juice and from this line it goes to a waxing system if you will wax a pomerant and all commercial pomerants are waxed that keeps the moisture in the fruit instead of letting it out and if you wax the fruit you'll extend the grub, the storage time by at least double what it would be otherwise and you can simply at home you can prepare a little paraffin and just dip them just in a very dilute paraffin mixture and you'll get you can keep them for six months in generally about six months by using wax on uh, next picture and this is a sorting line here they're being sorted into different boxes by size pomegranates are graded by size uh, they go anywhere from 18 count you, you can see a box on the floor there that is a, the average, that's, a, that's the box they go in. And normally that's a standard industry box. And they go from 18 fruit to a box to 48 fruit to the box. 48 fruit are pretty, what they call a 48 grade is real small fruit. 18 grade is real large fruit. And uh, all these fruit are first uh, sorted for any blemishes, any cuts on them. They can't have any cuts that are open where there's any uh, mold growing on them or they're discarded. They go basically to animal food if uh, if they can't be used for anything else. Next, this is a really pretty picture. Uh, pomegranates in full bloom are very ornamental. Uh, these these trees here are just starting to bloom, and they'll even be a little heavier than that later. Uh, and uh, but the blooms uh, are all on commercial variety are all single blooms. Nearly all the ornamental varieties are double blooms, uh, but all commercial varieties are, are single blooms. All fruiting varieties are single bloom uh, fruit. Next. Yeah, we can get the next picture. There we go. And then here's, a, here's the fruit on the trees ready to pick right after we showed them blooming. <laughs> It'd be nice if it worked that easy, but I'm afraid it's about anywhere from five and a half around five and a half months between those blooms and this fruit here. But uh, that's about how long, when you see one bloom, you can count about five and a half months and your fruit should be ready. But these are, these are nice fruit ready to, ready to pick and, and uh, put in storage or start eating right off the, right off the bat. Next. These are, these are something that's a little more personal here. These are three Trex Texas plants. Uh, the, First one is uh, Pecos, Texas. That's at a Texas A&M experiment station. We planted those, uh, let's see, in about 2004, I believe. Those are those trees that when that picture was taken, they were two years old. They grow very fast there, two-year-old trees. The next picture is of uh, uh, another planting that's in West Texas in the same area, and those trees are 21 months old. The lower picture is from my orchard in Brownwood, Texas, Oak Creek Orchard. And that tree there is three years old. And it's just starting to, to produce. Next picture. There's a little bigger picture of the Pecos Orchard. That was the next year those trees were uh, three years old when that was taken there. And uh, you can see how dry it is in that area. That area only gets 12 inches of rain a year. It's, it's somewhat similar to this area here as far as rainfall is concerned. Temperatures get a little cooler there than they do here in the wintertime. Uh, next picture. This is Sal. We, we nicknamed it Sal because we Salavosky was a little long for us. But this is one of the fruit growing on those trees you just saw. Very beautiful red fruit. 
uh, bright red arrows, uh, and uh, it is very cold hardy. It is. We've got. I've got some of these plants. I, I also have a nursery, by the way, and I've sold a lot of plants all over the United States. And I sent some of these plants to Tennessee, of all places. And Salavosky is still alive and, and, and fruiting in Tennessee now. It has a little protection, as like on the side of a house. But, uh, and other people in that same area are trying to grow it now, which is un nearly unheard of, but it, it is growing in Tennessee. Next picture. This is Sunbar. There's a little story about Sunbar. Sunbar is one of Dr. Levin's varieties out of Turkmenistan, as well as Salavosky is. Uh, Sunbar is a soft seeded early variety. Dr. Levin was trying to determine all soft seeded varieties generally are frost sensitive. Most, most soft seeded varieties are frost sensitive. They can't be grown in any of the more northern areas of pomegranate growth. Uh, they can stand down to about 15 degrees and that's about as low as they go without being killed back to the ground on most of the soft seeded varieties. A wheat plant, of course, we were testing varieties, and, and we have a planting in Fredericksburg in central, the central Texas area uh, at, a, at another a and experiment station. And we planted some of these just to taste, test the cold hardiness on the, of the varieties. And we planted some of these uh, soft-seeded varieties. And of all the soft-seeded, this is the only one we had one night, year before last, that got down to seven degrees. So we finally found a soft seeded variety that is cold hardy, and this is it. It's not only soft seeded, it's early. We can harvest this variety July the 31st in that area. That's really, really early for a pomegranate. It's also a fairly pretty pomegranate. Uh, large pomegranates, for an early pomegranate, normally most early pomegranates are fairly small. This, this one is not. This, this is a large one, very cold hardy and uh, has a good flavor and very soft seed. You might even call it seedless. The seed are so soft. It's not seedless, but that you'll hardly even notice the seed in them. Next picture. These are some bar that's ready to go be shipped. They are pretty, aren't they? they, they I, I don't know. I'm real proud of this variety. We found that, that finally found a soft seeded variety that can stand cold temperatures. And uh, it just took some of this research we did over the years to figure that out because there was a number of varieties that Dr. Levin had found that uh, uh, were early and soft seeded. And, but he didn't know, I, I think some of his research got interrupted before he really, he'd like to spend 10 more years researching. But when the Soviet Union broke up, he kind of got everything stopped. But we're real proud of this variety anyway, and it, it's a good one. How's the flavor on that? Is it mild flavored like most of the soft seeded ones? Or good yeah, it, it's a sweet variety. It's strictly sweet. Now you can pick it a little early if you want a little tartness. Now it'll give you tartness if you pick it early. <laughs> so if you want some tartness in this variety, just, just pick it a little bit early. Now here, here's an interesting story. We're, 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 we formed a cooperative to grow pomegranates in Texas. And you'll see the name up there, Pecos. Well, that variety is actually Suranor, S-U-R-H-A-N-R. That's the Turkmenistan name for it. The reason we changed it commercially, it's not changed, we admit, we, we, we altered the name, is because at the present time, Arab names are not well accepted in the United States, and I'm sorry about that. For commercial reasons, we had to have another name to sell it commercially. But it's, it's a good variety. You'll notice the arrows are mixed, so some of them are clear, some of them are red. We started to call it speckled because it, it, that's nearly always the way they come. Uh, mixture of red and, and, uh, and clear. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, that's the name we gave it. It's a fairly good looking fruit. It, uh, and it tastes real good. It has medium, seed, medium hard seed, moderate, somewhat similar to wonderful on seed hardness, which we call moderate seed. Next picture. This is another one that has another story. But I have stories about all these varieties because all of them took a lot of time to work out what, what they were and what, how good they were, if they weren't any good or whatnot. This is Texas Red. It originally had a number, only a number. This variety came into Byron, Georgia, in a group of plants. And Jack Rice pulled cuttings off of them. And he gave half the cuttings to uh, Dr. Chris Englison in, in uh, Georgia, southern Georgia. 
And uh, Dr. Anderson lost all the labels off of it. And you know how that, I'm sure some of y'all have done the same thing. You know, it's not easy. You lose a label, you don't know what you got, you know, and all that. So all he knew for sure was to come out of Byron, Georgia, and he was number 18 in the row. So he just called it Russian 18. Okay, we're still trying to figure out the, the, the Turkmenistan name for it. We, uh, Jeff, I talked to Jeff Mosfeller today, a little earlier today about this, and we're going to do some, uh, uh, he, he suggested we might consider doing some DNA testing on the Ryans to try to see if we can put the original name back on it. The reason you see the Texas Red name on it was because everywhere I sent it in Texas, from, you know, it's like California, we have a very varied climate. You know, we go from really cold to really warm. And, but everywhere we sent this variety in Texas, it did well. So we just thought it liked our state, so we named it that. You can call it anything you want to, but it's a good variety, whatever you call it. Uh, you notice the arrows are bright red. It has a very good taste. We've had uh, four taste testings now of pomegranate varieties of our co-op. Co-op has, has held four taste testings. And uh, this one here is, is came in first at one and second and, and another. Uh, we have two early season. We divided our taste testings into two because a lot of the early varieties are overripe by the time you get to the late season when the normal varieties come on. So we have an early season taste test and a, and a normal season taste test. The early season is held in September, the first part of September. And the normal season is the second or third week of October. And uh, so that's why we've had four, but it's only been two years. But this variety is very productive. You'll get anywhere from 70 to 100 fruit per tree, which is a pretty good load of fruit. Uh, you need to pull what we do. After the second bloom, we pull all the blooms off the tree after that. Because if you, leave, if you let the third or fourth bloom produce, you're going to get smaller fruit. If you'll pull the, uh, the, all, the, all the blooms after the second bloom, you get, usually get two to three to four flushes of blooms. Uh, bloom, Pomeranians bloom over a long period. You'll see them blooming for six, seven weeks. Sometimes you'll even see them blooming in the fall. But all those blooms, those late blooms, need to be pulled off if you want good fruit. You'll get larger, sweeter fruit if you, if you do pull the late blooms off the trees. Anyway, this is our number one variety for our co cooperative. It's very cold hardy. It's cold hardy. Salabosky is cold hardy. This variety here is cold hardy. But it, it's not only that, it's, it's very vigorous. It is, it's not, has a nice color and the arrows are really pretty and it tastes good. Everything we required of it, it gave us. Next picture. This is one of those, this is one of those taste tests I was talking about. This is, we're very informal, kind of like we are here. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but we just kind of get together and, and lay them out and test them. Next picture, I think we've got two pictures on this, there we go. That's just, that's the same tasting there. But we put them in little bowls and label them, and, and uh, we run a bricks test on them, which is pro most of you probably know that's soluble solids. Uh, relate somewhat to sugar content. Uh, and we run bricks, and then we run uh, pe people's opinions about what they taste like. Ne next. That's some pretty fruit. They really, really get attractive. The, the trees are really ornamental when they have this fruit ripe, and this was in West Texas, and these fruit are natural, those haven't been sprayed or anything, those are naturally glossy like that. That's Texas red again, by the way. I, I show a lot of pictures of it. Next. Yeah. And there's one of the fruit cup with the arrows, and uh, those are about right. Now, since we're looking at a picture of a cut fruit, I'll, I'll go over one thing. The rag content, the rag is a matician material between the arrow pockets. The rag content of pomegranate varieties varies a lot. Some varieties have as much as 50% rag. Some of them have as little as 30% as rag or petition material. So the, the content of the, the net content of edible fruit within a pomegranate varies a lot by variety. And this one here has nearly 70% uh, arrow content of the total fruit. That's by, that's by weight, by the way, not, not by volume, it's by weight. Next picture. There we go again. <laughs> I said keep showing that same variety, but anyway, 
Uh, you can see, uh, one reason I wanted to show this, you'll see the bottom, the bottom fruit to the left has a little bit of sunburn on it. That's what sunburn looks like. It even gets worse than that, but that's an example. And we're going to discuss some remedies for that here in a minute. Next picture. There we go again, that same little orchard. That's, let's go ahead and skip that one because we've already seen that. Okay, that's the micro sprinkle irrigation. A little closer up picture of it. And uh, like I say, these are being grown as a tree. And you can see the little micro sprinkler there. It's just a drip line and you just attach the micro sprinkler and stick it in the ground. And, and I prefer the adjustable kind. You can get all kinds of them. But this is a really good system. The only difference between, this is not my orchard, this is another orchard. I put lots and lots of mulch on the ground. Uh, we, we put anywhere from 6 to 12 inches of mulch every year on the ground around the trees. Uh, we use very, very little fertilizer because we don't have to with as much of mulch as we put on these trees. Next picture. Okay, here's, here's some remedies for some problems. And the first one you see up there is surround. It's actually labeled for sunburn protection on pomegranates. It's uh, organic, nothing but kaolin clay that's ground up, you know, that makes pottery. Make pottery out of clay on clay, it's ground up really, really fine. And you just mix it with water and agitate it while you're mixing it and spray it on the trees. And you're going to eliminate most of your sunburn. What is interesting about this round is that we thought that it would retard the color of the fruit. By, because it was somewhat of a barrier on the skin of the fruit, it actually doesn't. It acts as a prism and increases the color of the fruit. You'll get brighter color fruit with surround on the, on the trees. You'll have to put this on. You will not put it on until after the fruit form. You need to wait till the fruit at least uh, an inch or two in size. And then you start spraying with surround. If you get rain on, you need to, it'll, a lot of it will wash off. You'll have to spray it again. But once you get two or three applications, that should be, I usually use two applications. It's usually enough to uh, keep from getting sunburn because the sunburn occurs normally when the fruit are medium, small to medium. Once they get a little size on the skin, it starts getting tougher. And uh, another thing we found, the pomegranates attract stink bugs in our area. You know, and, uh, but surround is very sharp and it'll deter insects. It's, uh, it's got several purposes besides sunburn. And you'll see how some fruit are scarred. You'll see little spots on the fruit. That's usually by an insect stinging the fruit. There's another bug that's fairly common. I, most, I know most of you have probably seen it. It's called a leaf-footed bug. They love pomegranates. They, you hardly ever see a pomegranate grow without some leaf-footed bugs. They don't really hurt much if you'll put surround on them, but if you don't, they'll sting the fruit and they'll make, on the inside of the fruit, they'll make little black places. And that will cause fungus to form inside the fruit, which is a real problem. So you need to, you, like I say, surround is organic. So you can still be organic and use surround. So it's not, uh, I like, I, my orchard is organic, but, uh, uh, or surround's fine. Now, KO side, we have another problem, which is called heart rot on pomegranates. And uh, just about any form of copper, well, several forms, let's don't say any form, but most forms of copper uh, spray will kill fungus. Fungus enters the, will enter the fruit when the uh, fruit are, are, are just forming. When right after, you'll see a bloom come on the fruit. Oh, this is something probably we need to discuss anyway. The, the, you, there are male and female fruit on the pomegranate. Uh, some of you have wondered why a lot of your blooms fell off. Well. The majority of the blooms are male. Uh, when you see a bloom come over there, that's a female, it'll have a little ovary behind the bloom, which the male blooms don't have. <laughs> so you'll be able to recognize which are male and female. And uh, anyway, when the fruit are small, uh, fungus will enter the fruit before the calyx. The calyx is the crown on the fruit. Before the calyx closes, the, uh, the uh, fungus will enter the fruit. By spraying with a copper spray, there are natural forms of copper that are approved for organic use. Kaocide is not. It's not, a, not considered organic. But there are other forms you can use that are organic. Copper sprays. And that'll prevent what we, we call heart rot in Texas, what commercial growers in California call black hearts. Same thing. It's our ameliorate fungus. 
It's just, it's just a form of fungus. And uh, the one thing about uh, the fruit that have hard rot, they'll, they'll normally sink. If you put them in a vat of water, they'll normally sink, whereas the good fruit will float. Now, if they got just, have just a little bit of hard rot that had not fully matured, they'll still float, so you have to still inspect them. But you'll tell by the outside of the skin, the skin will be soft in a spot if they have hard rot inside of them that hasn't fully matured. Okay, next. This is, I thought, would be uh, something that we would need to go over because all of you are looking for different, a lot of you are looking for different types of varieties of a lot of fruit. But as to, in regard to pomegranates, you know, there's a lot of different members that have different varieties and, and they're a good source of material. Basically, what I'm saying here is if you can get them from a, another member or if you can get them from one of the trade days, that's where, that'd be the best source. The last source should be the Davis Germplasm Collection because they're basically, to, they're, they're oriented more towards research. They're there for us, and you can get cuttings from them. But if you can get them from other people, well, that I would that would be the best. In other words, we can overtax the system at Davis if we have too many requests coming in every year. So that's all I'm saying. But anyway, there's a lot of sources. Next. Next. Uh, and also, we have, uh, you, can, you can basically read what it says there. Uh, I sell uh, plants, and uh, another man in, in Ballinger, Texas, sells plants of these Central Asian varieties. We've sold, I've personally sold over 10,000 plants in Texas, starting to trying to start pomegranate groves in Texas. We have, in the process of building greenhouses to grow out 100,000 plants a year. Uh, because in commercials, we have to have quantity. It takes a lot of plants to make a commercial operation. Uh, we have, uh, at these agri-life stations, which is Texas A&M Extension, we have those plantings, we have cutting days, normally in January, and uh, it's available to anybody that wants to come to them. Uh, but that's just for anybody that's you know, around Texas, it's close by. Uh, next, here's additional information. Uh, we have a website, texaspomerance.org, for our cooperative website. We also have a bulletin board, which is texaspomerancegrowers.com, and my own website is oakcreekorchard.com. These have a little more information on all of them. If you're looking for information, it, it, just the fact they're in Texas doesn't make any difference. The information is there. Next. That's the book I wrote, uh, and Barbara helped me with. <laughs> She's back there. Uh, we uh, had David Silverstein help me with it. Uh, we, uh, we tried to put this together as a grower's book. Uh, Dr. Levin had written a book about pomegranates, just called Pomegranate. And we were trying to get it published. And uh, it would, the only problem was it was in Russian. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't work too good. So, so uh, it, part, it had been partially translated to English. And David got his aunt in, in uh, Louisiana to finish the translation. And we finally got it translated into uh, English, and it's also available, that's not a picture of it. Uh, it's available uh, at Amazon, or there's a couple of websites you can buy the book, Dr. Levin's book as well as this one. Dr. Levin's book is a, is a scientific work. Uh, it is more oriented towards the scientific aspect of it. This is more of a, you know, just a common course book, you know. With, with basic information. Got a few pictures in it too, I always like pictures. Uh, uh, picture books are always nice. Next. That's something I found to be universal. All kids love pomerants. I have never found, I suppose there's a kid somewhere that doesn't like pomerants, but I haven't found one so far. They love to split them open and eat the arrows out of them. And uh, this is David Silverstein's daughter. And uh, she she really likes them. I know she's kind of making a face, but but she really does like progress. I think that's the end of the PowerPoint. I'll go ahead and do a little talking, but that's all the pictures. And uh, thank you. I think I think it'd be good if uh, I know in a normal speech.
don't have questions, but I think there's a hundred questions out there, and there always is. I've given them quite a few talks at different places. And I think it'd be good, and we'll learn a lot. If somebody if has a question, just raise your hand, and we'll then try to answer them. Yes. Do what? Yes, that's a good question. That's that always brings out the best to, to understand. Yes, you can grow them from seed. Uh, most of the hybrid varieties, it's not a good idea to try to grow them from seed. We always try to grow them from cuttings because they they're a clone. They're a clone of the original plant, and they come 100% true to the variety if you could take them from cuttings, and that's always the best. There are some of the old varieties that have been around for a thousand years that will come nearly true from seed. Wonderful won't. Wonderful in the common variety in California will not come true from seed. You'll get some plants of a lot of different varieties. This has been scientifically proven. It was, there was research done, done in the 1920s, and out of a thousand plants, they got about 300 that were fairly good and about 700 that weren't any good. But we also have a variety called Kandahar Hansi, or we call it Kandahar Early because it's an early variety. Uh, it came out of Afghanistan. It, there's, a, there's a poem about it that was written nearly 1,400 years ago about the same variety. Old variety, we've, done, we've propagated from seed and it comes 90, so nearly 95% true from seed. So some you can, some you can't to answer your question. Very seldom. There, there are some pomegranates growing in, in Russia in areas that get snow. There's one variety that was actually bred for that purpose, one called Agat, A-G-A-T. It's in the collection at Davis. It's a, it's a low-growing tree. It was made so that the snow would cover the tree. The snow provides insulation. It can't be exposed to the outside temperatures because in that, those same areas it may get down to zero or below or ten below. But as long as it's covered by snow, it's fine. It, it'll, it'll survive. But so, it, but it's grows so low, it grows maybe about five foot tall. It's about as tall as it get. Uh, so yes, there are some that will grow, but they have to be fully covered. If they're uncovered during the winter, they'll usually die. Question? Yes. Uh, when they're growing from seed, uh, how long does it take to fruit them? It takes a year longer if they're grown from seed than cuttings. Cuttings will mature in about three years. Uh, seed will mature in about four years. Does it make sense to prune the suckers all summer long or do you wait until the... No, you, you need to prune them at least once a month during the summer if you've got young trees because uh, they'll get out of hand if you don't. They, they, and it'll take a lot of vigor out of the tree if you don't prune them back. Uh, you see a lot of trees with suckers around them and they may only be three or four month old suckers but that tree would have grown another foot if you'd have pulled the suckers off of them and you'd have had a taller tree. What spacing is How many spacing is there? Oh, good. How spacing is there? Oh, tree. Okay, for distance. The, normally, uh, in most orchards, they're planted uh, 14 foot between trees and 17 foot below between. Uh, between rows and 14 foot between trees. Now that, the only reason for the 17 foot is because you have to have, be able to get some equipment down the rows. We plant them normally 20 foot because we like to have a, a tractor go down the middle of rows because we have to move fruit in and out and spray trees and we need a tractor. So we normally do it 20 foot between rows. There is a difference. There's basically a division in the Pomeranian world between soft seeded and, and moderate and hard seeded varieties. Uh, and the soft seeded rice can be planted 10 to 12 foot apart and the moderate to hard seeded need to be about 14 foot. But the, the, the soft seeded rice tend to be smaller trees. They're not as big a trees as a moderate seed. Wonderful is a, one that's, for example, is a need one you need to plant 14 foot. Uh, trees like uh, Parfianca and Elf and whatnot, 10 foot's probably close and you can plant them 10 foot apart. Most people use about 12 foot on those. But uh, most of our growers just go ahead and put them all at 14 foot, but 
but you can plant them at 10 to 12 foot the soft seeding ones. Well, the problem is to take the grains out of there. Is, did anybody discover any method or any machine to take the grains out? Uh, take the suckers away, you mean? Uh, uh, arrows. 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 Oh, the arrows, yes. Okay, all right, good question. Uh, yes, there is machinery that was developed in Israel that will remove the arrows. Uh, there's the plant in Reilly, California is doing that at present. They've got problems though. It doesn't do it real well. Right now they're losing about 50% of the arrows to the process. And uh, they're, only they're only able to recover about 50% of the arrows. Because Wonderful Variety has a high concentration of rag in it. We, uh, with our Texas Red Variety, we can pull out 90% of the arrows with the same system. It's just the difference in the rag. And it's, it, they're harder to get out of Wonderful than they are out of Texas Red. They'll nearly fall out when you open one of these. What causes the pomegranate to split? Okay, that's, that's natural, that's nature. It's na that's its natural way of propagating itself. In nature, it splits, the bird pick up the seed and they spread them and, and that's the way it was naturally done. And we don't like them to split, we don't want them to split, and there are pomegranate varieties that won't split, or are very seldom split. One called Adasprosky Karaja is the one that's a non-cracking variety. Uh, and you'll find that in the germplasm collection. Is it uh, the uh, not picking it when it's ripe that causes the split? Uh, it's water content. Uh, the, uh, the, the, when the nights start getting cool, the pomegranate's skin stops growing. Just as soon as you start getting cool nights, nights below 50 degrees, the skin will stop growing. But if you get a rain or you have a lot of moisture in the, in the soil, the interior will keep filling up with moisture and something has to give. And basically that's what happens. It won't occur until the splitting would normally won't occur unless you have a severe drought or until the nights get cool, one or the other. In other words, it, it's got to be either stress or you get cool nights and then you start seeing splitting. Most growers stop water pomegranates in August in order to just let whatever's in the soil finish them off, finish ripening them. That way they have less chance of uh, splitting. So it's not a good idea to water pomegranates in September, if, unless you want a lot of split fruit. Yeah. I'd like to ask you if in Texas or in other state has been done analysis of how much antioxidant the soft seeded pomegranates have compared to the dark seeded color. If yeah, that's, that, 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 that's another one. Yeah, uh, they don't have as much. The color is related, the, the antioxidant content is related to the color. The darker red they are, the higher the antioxidant color. That has been proven. The, the soft seeded varieties, if they have color, now there's some soft seeded varieties that have a lot of color to them. And they know they will have antioxidant values, but if, if they don't have a lot of color to the arrows, now we're not talking about the outside of the fruit, we're talking about the, the arrows themselves. If they don't have a lot of color, they'll be a lower. Harvey, are you here? Yeah. Harvey, oh yeah, here's another Harvey. We got two Harvey. Harvey. Harvey right here has got has imported one from Israel. That's a little handheld device that that works fairly well. Uh, Harvey, would you stand up so they know who you are? I think he still has it, do you? I do. I'm, I'm not gonna have them much longer. I imported um, a couple hundred of them and there was um, Food Illustrated came out with an article a couple weeks ago and now I've been bombarded with the email. Okay, good. It's a little device that helps remove the arrows. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little device. Yeah. You mentioned using uh, surrounded with water uh -huh. as, a, as an insecticide uh, preventing sleep loss. It doesn't prevent them. It just slows down their... their it won't kill them at all. No, it's, it's strictly organic. It will not kill anything but it'll keep them from getting on the fruit because they don't like to walk around in little short pieces of glass, you might say. Yeah, Barbara? What about the bacterial infections of heart rot? Well, that, that's what I was talking about. Heart rot, black heart. That's, the, that's what we're using. The, that's what we're using, KOSI, the copper fungus spray at 
right after bloom time for it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a real problem in some areas. It's a, it's a remedy for greening, you know, on citrus, yes. Yeah, we don't, I don't know. The answer to that is just, I, I, we don't, we haven't tried it. Uh, it's fairly easy with just a little attention to keep the, the, the pomeranians from uh, insect and fungus free. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, if you're just growing them for home use, you don't have to use anything. I mean, they may be discolored slightly, but the arrows will be good inside of them. Uh, if you'll pull all the dead fruit, and this should, should be done every year, any dead wood, any dead fruit, any dry fruit should be pulled off the tree. Don't let it sit on the tree over winter because that fungus is just going to collect in that, that uh, drying fruit. Your question? Uh, I'm, I'm to your left. Okay, but there that go. doesn't make me a liberal at all. <laughs> <laughs> would uh, would having mulch, heavy mulch, and keep the moisture continuous? At the, uh, prevent splitting or help against it, it, it will help because you won't have to water as much you won't you you just keep a moderate moisture in the soil it's that's what mainly we use it for is to reduce the amount of moisture we have to put in the ground it also provides fertilizers that breaks down uh, some of the best fertilizer in the world is made from mulch is it wood chips or composted process just bulk wood chips well you, yeah that's what we do we bust wood chips but but you know, it you get into the mulching thing. You, you know, leaves break down a lot faster than wood chips, but we don't want them to break down too fast because we want the uh, orchard to be uh, uh, the moisture to be held in the ground. So we, we're using this uh, to hold it. This Texas drought is it having an effect on you? And how much water do you have? Well, where I am at, we I have irrigation water from a large lake. Uh, and, but our lake's getting low, so we have had to reduce our water by 50%. Uh, luckily, pomeranians can stand a little reduced water, so our pomeranian crop was normal this year. We had to reduce pecan crop, though, and pecans are going to be very high this year. They're all over the country. Yeah, Harvey? Are you marketing a generic product, or are you by variety? How do you educate consumers on different varieties? And so well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, we uh, consumers want to know things about different varieties. They like to try taste different varieties, and they'll buy their if you label them by variety, they'll sell higher than they would otherwise. Uh, if you have time to do that, now we're in our commercial operation, we just don't have time to do that. But we we do we have two labels. One of them's called Texas Bold, and one of them's called Texas Sweet. And one of the bold is for the moderate seeded sweet tart varieties, and the sweets for the soft seeded sweet varieties. That's the only we separate in those two categories. Um, how about pruning techniques? Are there different ways you should prune them other than just cut off the suckers or, or not? Well, in the first year, you ought to just let them grow when you first put them out. The second year, you ought to start trying to train them to three to four trunks. Uh, and the, the third year, the same thing. And by the third year, you're going to start second and third year, you'll start seeing suckers. And you pull all of them off except those three or four trunks you want to save. Now, some of them may look nearly the same size, but you still have to get them down to three or four trunks. If you let them go to all suckers, they'll wind up with no fruit hardly. But three is better than four. The, le the less stems, usually the higher production. That's why California, a lot of California commercial growers went to single trunks, because you do get a little higher production. Most of the world doesn't do that because but most of the world has other problems besides as far as weather goes and that's why they, they go to three or four trunks because if one dies they have another one there they don't lose a whole crop at one time. But uh, that's not as much a problem in the San Joaquin Valley. Yes? Yeah, they can definitely grow in harmony. 
the only thing you have to do, you have to use more fertilizer because you're going to have to feed the pomerant as well as the grass. But yes, they grow well together. You'll have a little more problem with diseases, but for most homeowners, that's not a great problem. You don't care if it's got a little scar on the fruit as long as it tastes good, you know. But for commercial growers, that's why we keep them clean. We can't have scars on the fruit if we're doing it for commercial. All right. I believe that's about it. Thanks, thank you all.